my name is Henry Drexler. I'm the newly appointed Chenango County historian. And uh, we're having our first and hopefully annual meeting of uh, public historians in Chenango County today. The subject of our, of our program today is going to be researching, writing, and publishing local history. And we have a top-notch lineup of presenters today uh, to help us uh, learn how to do our jobs. I want to thank Jessica and the crew here at the Historical Society for making the uh, uh, building and facilities available to us today. And uh, Marissa is a Colgate University student, I believe, is going to be recording our session today so that we can uh, use it for uh, the benefit of people that were unable to attend today and for future recruiting for people to write for the Historical Society Journal. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce <coughs> Margaret Ross and Chris Buck. Uh, they have published a number of uh, books, including Working Lives, uh, Thanks for the Memories, As Time Goes By and Everybody Has a Story. And I'd like to quote from Working Lives. People often think that our own stories are not important or that, we, or that they've done nothing unique, but everyone has had an experience no one else has, our memories, our history. And without further ado, uh, ladies, you're on. Okay. Yes, I'm half of the duo. Peg will be coming on soon. And I'm Chris Buck. I'm the president of the Smithville Historical Society. And a plug I'd like to give is that this barn we're in used to stand in Smithville, the town of Smithville. So we're very proud that uh, the Historical Society and all the workers preserved it. Our program for today, I'm going to be speaking probably for about 15 minutes unless I get sidetracked. Peg is going to show some slides and we'll both comment at that time. And then if there's some time left, we're going to read one of the, a sample story from one of our books. In 2011, which is 10 years ago, two historians, Peg and I, had a dream. We would compile and publish a book of memoirs written by people with local ties. It wasn't our idea. We uh, lifted it from the Cortland County Historical Society where I was a member of the Publications Committee. Peg and I went to an opening reception for their book, which was titled, Cortland County Remembers Working. Afterward, Peg asked the question of me, do you think we could do a book like that? Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe we could. And we decided we would try it and focus on people's working lives. So her question was the beginning for us. Collaborating seemed to be what we wanted to do. Neither one of us thought we could do it on our own, and it turned out to be the right move, I think. Joining the two towns into one publication was natural. Smithville used to be part of Green until 1808, so they had a history. The towns are adjacent. People have moved throughout history back and forth between Smithville and Green. And Peg and I had worked on other projects together and we knew that we could do it. So our joint effort in two years of recruiting people to write and editing and indexing and publishing, uh, we, we launched the book at the La Green's Labor Day Festival on, in 2013. Working Lives, Stories from Smithville and Green. We didn't have any financial backing. At that point, Peg and I just went off on our own whim and decided if nobody bought the book, oh well, that was, that was an investment we made. But it was received with tremendous enthusiasm by people at Labor Day. And really, I think Labor Day, selling in public where a lot of people showed up helped us with sales because from then on it, it was almost entirely word of mouth. Uh, I think there was one post on Facebook. We did a postcard that we didn't send to all that many people, but word of mouth seems to be the answer. We didn't think we would publish another book. We sat back in our 
glory. And uh, then people began asking, well, when's the next one coming out? And so we, well, we thought we could muddle along, and we did. And we, have, we published four books, at one every two years, between 2013 and 2019. We were absolute novices when we started. We claimed no expertise, uh, no special skills. We learned with every book we did. Sometimes we learned the hard way. And our presentation today is not intended to be a how-to. We would like to encourage everyone here to collect memories of people they know, people in your communities, and publish the memories. If we can do it, anybody can do it. It just takes some effort. Our books are different from those of a few other people who are going to be speaking today. We didn't research the material for the books. We didn't write the material for the most part. We didn't footnote the books. All we did was collect people's stories, compile them, edit them, and publish them. We added a few stories in of our own that when we needed to uh, get to the publisher before the next Labor Day and we didn't have enough stories yet, we uh, put ourselves into the mix. Some writings are historical records and they're all first person pieces and Don tells me that's anecdotal history. Um, examples are memories of Greenstown baseball teams in the 1970s, working on the DL&W Railroad, and the founding and growth of the Berean Bible Church, which began in Green and now has expanded to several other communities. Others of the writings are warm historical family recollections people talking about their parents and grandparents, uh, their teachers, their schools, memories of the family farm, memories of working. And some stories uh, simply relate a first one individual experience or tell a story. We're proud to say, I, at least I'm proud, that we used every single recollection that was submitted to us. Uh, some are short, some are long. Some people, um, we, we didn't even have to edit a word of their stories. Some people could barely write. And we edited heavily and can say that I think all the writers were proud of how they appeared in our books. The first thing we did when we got started, we knew we had to brainstorm and we got a few other people together, Historical Society members and talked about who could we approach to write? Who do we know that has a story that's willing to write? So we listed the names of the people and then made personal contacts. And by far, throughout the four books, our most difficult task was getting people to write. And I think Don knows that problem. Uh, we asked a lot of people. Some people love to talk, but they don't want to put anything on paper. We told them, just put something down and we'll fix it up and you'll look like a genius. And that didn't work for everyone. Some people flat turned us down and said, I'm too private, I don't want to do that. Someone who had worked for the police said, everything I did was negative and I'm not gonna go there. Um, so some people came forward immediately and some people we had to bug and bug and bug. Some came through, some didn't. That's how it is. We did personally interview a few people and either ghostwrite their stories or show that they came from an interview, but it became clear that we were so busy trying to do the book that that was too big a project for us to interview everybody and it just didn't happen. But we were grateful. Some family members stepped in to help or friends of people and either helped them write the story or wrote about the people. One I was thinking of on the way up, we had a Japanese war bride living in Green, and her granddaughter interviewed her, wrote her story, and one of the most humorous parts that I can remember is her 
Her grandmother was trying to be an American. You know, she had come to the United States. She wanted to be an American. She thought she would make a pie for her husband. And she got out the recipe, made the dough, and the next step was roll out the dough. She picked up the dough, rolled it into a ball, and plopped it into the pie plate, and then put some fruit around it. So that was her idea of how you roll out the dough. <laughs> Um, once, we get, once we gathered the stories, the technical work started. It took us two years between the inception and the publication, and as I said, we launched our first book at Green's Labor Day in 2013. Readers loved the stories because they brought back their own memories of a time <clears throat> that now seems more gentle uh, than we're knowing. Then they began asking, when is the next book coming out? And we stepped forward. The first publication had the theme of working, people's jobs, people's working lives. But from then on, the next three books, anything goes. Uh, we took stories about anything, either relating to our communities or someone who lived here and wanted to tell a story about somewhere else. Life in our area was celebrated by a great diversity of writers. We had physicians, we had business owners, we had uh, family members from Green's Raymond Corporation, we had business people, we had homemakers, we had farmers. Um, it's it's a, just a diverse series of memories. And throughout the books, uh, we can point to kindness and wisdom as being a common theme. Convincing people to write remained a challenge throughout the books, and we compensated in any way we could think of. One technique was we began to develop what we called short shorts. These were little paragraph length memories that we grouped either by town or by category. Uh, Green's Labor Day was one of them and Swimming on the Jenny Ganslet Creek was another, and we had Smithville, we had Green, we had Brisbane. Some of the entries we got from emails that people would send to us, uh, either now or they had already, and we grabbed them, uh, but I think really those are some of the more interesting uh, segments of the book, and we loved collecting them. We used other creative mem uh, methods, we twisted the arms of our family, friends, and fellow historians, Vicki. <laughs> um, we hunted for stories that were already written. Some were from newspapers, some were from historical society files, some were from family files, and occasionally we used one from another publication if it made sense. For those, we did ask permission uh, where it was available. And one came from a Facebook post. Peg saw a wonderful Facebook post and said, that tells a story about green, and we got permission and used it in the book. If we happened on an especially good story from a neighboring town, we stepped over the border and included it in the books. I know we have one or two from Afton, um, McDonough, Norwich, Oxford, Triangle, Whitney Point, and somewhere near White Store, a story took place and the man couldn't remember exactly where it happened, but it was a haunted house somewhere near White Store. We searched through oral history recordings uh, that had been done. We found, as I mentioned, some people living in our town that were willing to write. They, they really didn't have a lot of memories that they felt were pertinent to this area, but they wrote about other, other happenings. We used letters and vintage diaries, and they weren't the boring kind of diaries where it rained today, you know, brought hay in today, and so forth. I want to read you one. It's not politically correct anymore, but it's from 1985, Lois Huddleston. It rained real hard, much needed. Of course, that's a boring one. I volunteered to work on the Red Cross Bloodmobile in Green. I worked from 11.30 to 5.30. When I went to get my storm coat, someone had taken it by mistake. 
Jack, the name, brought me home to get my other car keys as I had left my car keys in my coat pocket. I learned something from that. <laughs> Lynn and Tim drove back to Green with Jack and got my car. A man had taken my coat and called me later at 10.15 to say that he had it. No one but a man does this kind of thing. <laughs> I don't know whether she meant takes the storm coat or calls me at 10.15, but, but that's what she said. And then as we got closer to each publication date, Peg and I uh, wrote some things or dug around for things we had written before. And we tried to get, uh, an, and we do have an average of 75 stories in each book. So at the same time we collected stories, we looked for photographs to illustrate them. And most came either from town historian files, historical society files, or from the writer or the writer's family. Occasionally we needed to take a current photo to fill something in. Without any uh, plan or avert decision, Peg became the photograph editor and she became our accountant. And I became the text editor and the creator of the master file that went to the publisher. Also, I was the indexer, which with Word presented me with a tremendous challenge. I made a big mistake my first time around. And as my mother used to say, live and learn, and I did. When we were ready to publish book one, it was our good fortune to connect with Cortland Press in Cortland. They had years of experience doing Cortland County Historical Society publications. And the owner offered to do our books to design and lay them out with no charge. She loves history, she supports historical societies, and she enjoys being creative. So we turned it over to her. In our four books, we preserved 300 individual stories and a host of paragraph length memories. If they hadn't been published, if these works hadn't been published, we all know they, they would be lost. Two writers were born during the Civil War, one in 1861 and one in 1862. We included the recollections. One came from a family, from a descendant's attic, and the other came from an archive far away from here. Some of our writings uh, cover happenings from just a few years ago. And to me, that is part of our continuum of history, gathering people's memories. And we know if you can get the memories down when they're fresh, they're bound to be a little more accurate than if you're writing about 50 years ago and let's see, what did I do back then? And so forth. I tallied up the names of our individual writers before I came today and I have to say I got a little bit overwhelmed because some people wrote for more than one book. But if I counted right, we collected personal memories from 236 individuals. And of those 236, more than a third are now deceased. You might wonder how many books we've sold because uh, that's a nice thing for historical societies to know. We have ordered during the last eight years 1,240 books and we have a few left but we just keep reprinting them as we uh, go, go forward. Uh, the nice thing about Cortland Press is you don't have to order 3,000 books at once. If you need 50 books, they're glad to do them. They're still selling, and we have a waiting list right now. We're out of one book that I just picked up yesterday, and we expect that they will continue to sell unless somebody puts them online. Looking back on the project, um, Peg and I agree we're glad that we collaborated. It would have been a monumental task for one of us. And if I had taken the project on myself and had 100 books printed, uh, I don't know that I could have sold 100 in Smithville. But between Green and Smithville, if people were interested in either area, uh, that seemed to work. Uh, working together also allowed us to collect enough stories so that we could print a book. If either of us had to come up with 75 stories per book, we'd have had trouble, but it worked. 
And Green and Smithville Historical Societies continue to benefit. We decided at the beginning any profit would be split between the two historical societies, and we're still doing that. And right now we hold back enough money so that if, the, for the next printing, we have the cash to pay for it. And so it's just a rolling account that seems to work. We also uh, know that we worked very well together. It's hard not to work well together with Peg. Uh, we learned that we could depend on each other. And I can't point to one single disagreement that we had. Maybe Peg can, but I can't. We didn't disagree on anything. We were both remained flexible and it just worked. Before I turn the program over to Peg, I have three final comments I'd like to make. First, um, after the fact, many writers told us of the joy that they had felt as they wrote and remembered the past, either their own families or jobs they had had or some event that happened. They were joyful. And we felt a really warm glow from that. Second, one writer telephoned me and said, thank you for collecting and compiling these stories. If you hadn't done it, who would have? A point well taken, and, and we were proud of that. Third, as I think back on my life, publishing these books is one of the highlights. I feel incredibly uh, helpful to other people by getting their stories and publishing them and helping them get some joy out of them. Peg and I are incredibly proud of what we did and uh, we hope that other people will move forward and, and do something, get some stories and get them printed. Thank you. as Chris said, I did the photographs for the books, pretty much laid them out. Or well, no, I didn't lay them out. <laughs> That's one of the things that I wanted to mention, that I did not lay them out because the publisher didn't want them laid out. They like to do that themselves, I think. I mean, this publisher didn't want the photos embedded into the stories because they just took, had to take them out. So. We didn't do that after that. <laughs> well, I'm going to start out with our covers. This was the very first one with Working Lives, and as you, well, maybe you can't see it very well. We did Smithville and Green with the photos, and there's up at the top right is a barber shop in Smithville many years ago. I don't know exactly how many, but it was an old photo. And then on the left in the middle was an old home ec photo from Green. And then on the bottom is a worker in Tarbell Farms in the area where they're, they're uh, bottling the milk. And on the right bottom is just an ice cream shop in Green called Lawton's that everybody knew about. And uh, of course, I get everything's gone that's on this picture, this no cover, everything's yeah. gone. So in a way that's if we had it. Is it this one? Yeah. Is it working? No. Maybe I better do it with Yeah. Hit the enter. Yes, there we go. I'll do it with that. <laughs> this was our second one. Thanks for the memories. On the top left is the flood of 1935. It's Hansman's Mills in Smithville, but it looked like Smithville got hit very badly during the flood. <coughs> so next in the bottom left, that's the, one of the round barns in green that's on Route 12 when you go through. And that was a, a, a car that the son had built <laughs> himself. He built it completely himself. And he and two friends went to the World's Fair in 1939 in Long Island uh, in that car. <laughs> so that was nice to have. The other on the right is Brisbane, a, 
an aerial view of just Route 12 going through Brisbane. And then down at the bottom are two clowns and they were at the Labor Day. So that was that. And that memory book, that's the one we don't have any. It's all sold out. But we've got some in my car. In, in my car. car. in, in my car. car. She's got some. She just picked them up <laughs> yesterday. So. As time goes by, as our third book, we liked our titles. <laughs> we thought about them quite a bit, you know, what to t use for history. That You can see the sheet music is in the back of that one as time goes by. We did not do these covers. The publisher did them. It was, I thought she was very clever, a uh, female. Did them. And then um, on the top, the right left, is a big, mansard roof house in Smithville that they moved and it's still there. Is it for sale? Hard to say. Sometimes oh. it is and sometimes it oh. isn't. <laughs> but it's there. When you go through Smithville you'll see it on your right as you're going from green to through Smithville. And on the right top is a school photo of Smithville. It must have been some kind of a fair. An agricultural fair and someone's holding a chicken and somebody's holding a cabbage and uh, they had each brought something to school, and I think it was also tied in with 4-H. I think the school and 4-H uh, collaborated many times. And then the bottom left is a big dance, a ball they had in green, and it was to raise money for the Green Hospital, which became defunct, but this was a big thing. And on the left is our State Senator Ives. You remember that? Well, the Ives family were still very big, and aren't they? In Guilford? In Norwich, and yeah. All over. He was a state senator and his wife. They were there. And um, it was a big <laughs> deal. <laughs> it was held. Where was it held, that ball? I'm not sure myself oh, where it was. And then this is our last cover. On the top left is a houseboat, and it was owned by Westcott Rathbone. And if you know anything about Green, you might have heard of Wacky. <laughs> now his nickname is Wacky Rathbone. Everybody knew him, and he, he was really a nice guy. And he goes way back, the Rathbones go way back to the early, early settlers in Green. On the right is the general store in Smithville. If any of you go through and want a nice sandwich, it's a great place. I don't know if any of you go through Smithville much, but it's a very good place to get a sandwich. And we're hoping, that there's a Dollar General that just opened in Smithville. We're hoping that it doesn't conflict with this general store too much. Bottom left are trucks from Hansman's Mills. You want to say something about Hansman's, Hansman's Mills Pancake Flour? Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hansman developed an instant mix where you just add water. And people, I don't know if anybody has ever had Hansman's pancakes. You've got to be a certain age, I think. But they were wonderful pancakes. <coughs> the mill just was, would, the mill burned down this year. So the mill is gone. The just, old mill. And just recently. Everyone's sorrowful. Did they ever find out whether it was arson? Or I keep not? asking. Nobody is nobody saying, but, but I don't know what it would have been otherwise. Right. And the bottom right is a a little girl on her pony, and that was Labor Day. I thought it was such a sweet photo that we put it on the cover. Those are our four things. Now, I'm going through the very first stories that we had on each book. It was Chris' suggestion that with our first stories, we should have one that was strong, written very well, and with general interest. And this, of course, this one was Labor Day. You know, we all we have this hose fight that's quite well known in Green. And uh, in the old days, this was they were it was dangerous because they really they aimed the hoses at each other on the teams. And they were very powerful hoses with the water. They don't do that anymore. It's a ball up on top that they put a wire on and then they 
they try to get the ball to the opposite end where the opponents are. Well, that's Labor Day. And it was written by, oh, well, I put, it was written by my daughter, Valerie Ross. She writes well. And it was her memories of being a little girl. And oh, Labor Day used to be the biggest day of all time for the kids. There's another one of the Labor Day. It's kind of, well, it hasn't, it isn't disappeared, but it's not like it used to be. You know, they just didn't keep it, and they, they hardly had it last, last year during COVID. Okay, this was our second story. This was written by John Buckholz, who is Chris's brother, and it's called, I Sang with the King of the Cowboys. And here he is as a little boy, and there it is. You want to comment on that? Yeah, uh, that's one that he had written before, and we needed more stories, and so I put the arm on him. Um, but he, when he uh, was a personnel manager in, in Philadelphia, he had an invitation to the opening of a Roy Rogers, what did they call them, coffee shop, or Roy Rogers oh, had yes. a series of stores. Yeah. And he went to it, and Roy was standing there by himself, and he said, Roy, you want a cup of coffee? And they went and sat down in a booth, and they sang together. And I mean, that's one of the highlights of my brother's life, singing with his hero, Roy Rogers. And that's an example of a story. My brother lives here, but it's something from his past life. Right. Oh, that. it's cricket. That's all right. Um, this one was called A Dad is a Dad by Jack Doolittle. And it was just a very nice story about uh, his, his father and how, you know, he just, you'd have to get our book to read all these. <laughs> <laughs> and this one was written about Oxford. And it was written by um, Jean Spencer Marks. And her father was the Editor of the newspaper. What was the name of it, Vicki? The newspaper? Oxford Review. Oxford Review. And uh, she wrote about, he must have been a character because this story was about uh, some kind of a revival that was going to be put on in this park, Lafayette Park. And uh, I, I wouldn't, I'm not going to spoil it for you. I will tell you, though, that he put soap bubbles in the fountain and that kind of messed up the revival. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> she didn't tell us that. No. <laughs> she didn't mention that. It was a whole group of outsiders coming in for this religious, mm -hmm. the religious revival. Revival, yes. <laughs> oh, that's funny. She didn't mention that. Then I just picked out some of the pictures that I liked, that, uh, just through some of the stories. And this is uh, Swift Tarbell. He was Gage Tarbell's son. And he's, I even have the names of his horses here. Tony, Blazer, and Molly. And I just think it's such a nice picture. He spent a lot of time at the Tarbell Farms. And we have several articles about Tarbell Farms, don't we? Mm -hmm. I, encourage, I think uh, Chris should write a book about the Tarbell Farms. Maybe she'll do it. When I'm in my rocking chair. <laughs> <laughs> then this was interesting. This is Tarbell Farms, but I took the picture because of the chickens. We had a series of letters written by a man who, he was just a young man, and he spent time here as an employee, and he's, his job was with the chickens. And he wrote home all the time, Dear Mother, while he was there. And we even, you can't read it, and I don't expect you to, but we put his letters in one of the books, and they're nice to read. You can see them, they're very clear in the book. And we, it was a kind of an experiment to see if we could take somebody's typing, typing and put it in, and it worked out well. Oh, he was so formal, dear mother, dearest mother, but then love, Kenneth. He always signed his name, Kenneth. <laughs> I know him as Ken. I did know this man. This is a, a Holstein of Art Davis, and I know Henry knows, but uh, he had a beautiful, beautiful herd of Holsteins. 
And he kept telling me, he said, now this one was excellent, and this is excellent. And I found out later that that's always what they said when they judged, you know, <laughs> the, the really top dog, <laughs> top cow, <laughs> was an excellent cow, and they sure were. I, I, a neighbor told me she never saw such magnificent animals. She just thought when they were out, they were huge. This is from the Raymond Corporation, and it's kind of good because the man who's on the smaller truck is Chris Gibson. And Chris Gibson probably has more patents from the Raymond Corporation than anybody else there. He now has died, but he was one of the early engineers. And he uh, built, he designed this lower truck. And then the upper, the one on the right, that's the one that was uh, designed later. And it went up in the air 40 feet. And what, what's really nice about it is Chris is sitting on a pallet. And the pallets were really invented in green by George Raymond Sr. years ago in the 20s. And I, I just saw a, a, an article in, on the website about the pallets and who designed, who, you know, who invented the pallet? And the answer was George Raymond Sr. So not only do they have the electric trucks, the narrow aisle hmm. trucks, but they invented the pallet. Okay, that's you. Okay, that is the community center in Smithville and also the town offices. It was built in the 1840s as a Universalist church, and when the church declined to one member, they sold it to the Grange, I think for a dollar or ten dollars, and it was a Grange until uh, they had troubles keeping the building going. And, oh dear, what year was it? 1970s, I can't remember anymore, but uh, the town bought it from the Grange and converted it to, they added a wing on the back, converted it to town hall, and then the front section is a meeting room, and the Grange has the right to meet there. And everybody meets there, historical society meets there. Uh, it's just a general community center as well as the town offices. And we have a story written by the fellow who spearheaded the conversion of the building. Yes, good. It's a beautiful building. Oh, this is a houseboat that I mentioned earlier. We had it on the cover. And that is Wacky Rathbone on top of it. He built this houseboat out of, I don't know what he built it out of, to tell you the truth. I think but he has an admiral's outfit on. Yes, <laughs> he often had some kind of uniform on. Uh, I, I think, I'm not sure he was even in the military, but maybe he was in the Coast Guard. I don't know for sure, but anyway. Charlie Grace, his son-in-law, wrote the story about this houseboat, and it's hilarious, just hilarious, what happened with it. It, it sank <laughs> on one of, the, one of the lakes. I can't remember which one. Cayuga, I think, one of the Finger Lakes, anyway. And of course, he called away, and Charlie had to go up and help. You know, and here he was just married to his daughter. You know. It's a very funny story. Okay, you again. Okay, here we are at Hansman's Mills in Smithville, right on the river. And the building on the left is the building that just burned. And when Mr. Hansman bought the property, across the river was another building that was a sawmill, um, some kind of a fabric mill. And that just, he, he dropped that and the building is long and gone. And then, I thought I ought to put my... Yeah. No, this is what it looked like when it burned. Sort of. Hands. Looked a little worse than that. But. Yeah, a little <laughs> worse. I don't know what year this is. Well, yeah, you can see the car is old. Yeah. I don't know exactly, but I thought I would put one in modern, more modern. Oh, why don't you talk about this? Okay. Um, if any of you get to Green or have been in the area, 
a, a Mennonite family has a farm stand, Omer and Emma King, and they raise cattle. And Emma loves to write. They don't have a television, so in the winter, Emma writes. And she did quite a few stories for us. And so we thought a current photo would be nice along with some of the, the older. Actually, there aren't many older photos of them because they used to be Amish, and uh, there were no photos. Yes, that's true. Yeah. They did have dairy, but now they have just the Herefords here. Mm -hmm. yeah. They bought them from um, Smithville. <laughs> I was going to say. Buster. Buster, Buster Robo. And this is also Emma King. When she was a little girl, this author, Lois Lenski, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of her, but she wrote a lot of children's stories about different cultures and different ways children are brought up. And she went to the Amish and wrote this Shuplai girl, and she stayed with Emma's family. And she illustrates, all, she illustrated her stories. And you can see. So we got permission. We wrote to the Lois Lenski Foundation and got permission to use a couple of the illustrations. I think we, we used three. They're lovely. And Emma wrote her story about what yes. it was like to have this woman come to the farm and yes. live with them and, um, yes? She was Amish and then became Emma? Yes, Emma. Mm -hmm. They were out, ousted. Yeah, they were, yeah, they were ousted. Ousted. And they're yeah, shunned, shunned from they the were Amish. Shunned by the Amish. They have another group here that gets together, I don't know, somewhere in Bainbridge. Mm -hmm. You know that store in Bainbridge? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I they're, I think they're with them, I, I don't know exactly. No, that's Mennonite. That's Mennonite, okay. Yeah. Emma told me they were shunned because her husband was questioning some of the teachings. Mm -hmm. Well, she was a twin and um, that this is the illustration of the grandmother with the two girls there. And that's her twin sister. And she is in touch with her now. They telephone each other on their cell phones. <laughs> I don't know, but that she is in touch with her sister. Oh, this is, Chris mentioned we had a, a postcard made one of the gals in the Historical Society suggested it, that she knew a place we could get them quite cheaply made, and she went ahead and did it for us. And it was nice, actually. It was very nice because it gave the information on here. I don't know, can you read it? Highly anticipated fourth volume about Smithville and Green, uh, Peg Ross and Christine, another superb collection of first-person accounts, more than 70 in all sure to inspire and delight, $22 each. And then the back looked like this, and she told where you could get it, all the different places. The Moore Memorial Library, the town clerk's office in Green and in Smithville, both, and the Smithville General Store for $22 each. And then Chris said, and the trunks of our cars. We each carried a big box around, and <laughs> if somebody saw us on the street and said, hey, you know, uh, about that book, yep, come right over here with your money, and I'll sell you one. <laughs> oh, did I go back? You can't see it, but this is a master that Chris typed up every story, made it perfect, and this was one of the master files that was sent to the publisher of all the stories. She did that four times with all of the masters. And I mean, they're just perfect. She's such a good editor. You know, you need somebody who can edit something so you don't have any errors. I don't know of any error, real good error. Maybe we had a few, but I can't remember any error of spelling or anything yeah. in those books. That's pretty amazing. And that's Chris. And captions chosen for each story. I thought you ought to see one of those, too. They did not want anything. The photos had to be completely separate. And with the photos, they didn't want the captions on them. And so uh, 
the owner there, the, the printer, told us how to do it. Like number one, a dad is a dad. And underneath it, there was only one photo. And so that was one A with a caption. And then the next one, you know, whatever it was, that's two A because there was only one picture. And then a few, you can see, no caption, no caption. You had to write in no caption and just to help them out. And you know, that's one thing. Captions are another thing that uh, they're hard to, to know how to do them correctly. I didn't realize there was so much to captions. I kept learning and learning. And often you don't need one. You just don't. And keep them short. They don't have to be complete sentences. All kinds of things that I learned about captions. Do you want to add? I just would like to add, we did everything electronically. Uh, Yes. with our publisher, yes. which made it easy. We sat home and emailed files and everything like that. <laughs> okay, then Chris suggested we have the four final picture uh, stories because we tried to pick out something rather inspiring for the last four in the book, something that would make people think a little bit. This was Chris's father, and it's called uh, Dad During the War. Is that it? Yep. Yeah, Dad During the War by Chris Buck. And this was, was a filler. <laughs> it was a filler, but your father had a grocery store. My dad ran a grocery store, and he was an age between, he was too young for World War I, too old for World War II, although he was called up at the end of World War II. But he ran a grocery store, and he, he did everything in the community to help the war effort. They, you know, the, the Rotary Club collected metal. My dad helped harvest crops on people's farms because the young men were all at war. But anyway, and my dad had to deal with the people who came into the store and got mad when they didn't have what they wanted. Uh, you know, it was rationing and when it was gone. Anyway, I wrote about that thinking that every community had people like this who volunteered. Yeah. They were spotters for airplanes and collected paper. And yep. This is a very tragic one. Uh, it's called Remembering Hong Shu. It was written by her mother-in-law, Amy Marslin, who was the editor of the Shenango American. She was killed in 2009 at the American Civic Association, if you remember that. Uh, there were 13 that were killed, and um, she was down there learning English. She was at an English class, and uh, she was a lovely, lovely girl, and Amy just thought the world of her daughter-in-law, and she wrote this most poignant little story about her, how she came from China, and how industrious she was. She got a job right off, and one of these nail clinics, you know, the Asians often have the nail shops, and she just, everything about her, Amy just loved. And the ending was inspiring. She said, don't think of the people who were murdered as losers. It was the murderer who lost. They all had lives, they had real lives and contributed. This was another very, very nice story by uh, Jack Doolittle. He used to be a music teacher in Green, and then he became the principal, a superintendent. He went into, I think he was superintendent. Yes, I'm pretty sure he was. And uh, his story was an angel on Easter, and it was all about his grandmother, how wonderful she was. He even learned to tat with her. And nobody tats anymore. <laughs> and he, it's a lovely, lovely story. And then this one was, I just loved this story. It's called Farm Life in the Past, A Country Girl. Life's about 1868. When she was about, she was born in 1861, so we think she's about six here, or seven, and uh, with her sister. And it's, would you, it's, Chris found this story. Right. This is one that was in the Descendants' Attic. And it was written, I want to say, in the 1920s. And she recalled life uh, along the Jenny Ganslet Creek on the family farm and went into great detail, especially about what her mother did to keep 
the farm going and to make candles and make clothing mm -hmm. and air out clothing. And, um, she okay. ended with a, a nice uh, poetic quote that of course I don't have with me, but it just gave you a glow when you read it. It's a lovely thing. Yeah. This was the house. It used to stand in Jenna Ganslet until I don't know when it fell in. It's no longer there. But this was the house, the Bradley house. And her, the family, the Bradleys, were again one of the first settlers in Green. And that is still there, the barn. Do you have a picture of that? The barn Henry? that Henry likes. You do? I'm sure you do. Because it's <coughs> No, this is a different one. You'd like to look at this one, I think you said. It's in the Jenna Ganslet, on Jenna Ganslet Road there. Oh. County Road 2. Okay, now? Okay, now uh, we've got enough time where I am going to read you one of the shorter stories and one that I find particularly uh, appealing. Uh, the Macaulay family moved to Green in 1992, and this house is right along the Shenango River, the backyard backs backs up to the river. And Tammy McCauley wrote this uh, recollection of one particular event. <clears throat> one major downside of living on Monell Street, I soon discovered after moving to Green, was the cats. They were using my flower garden as a litter box and spraying the front door. But the last straw was when my four boys, ages five and triplet four-year-olds, came in from playing in the sandbox that was kept covered, and they smelled. Well, you know what I mean. I was beside myself. Get a dog, my neighbor Sherry said. A dog, I thought. I had read somewhere that four years old was the perfect age for kids to get a puppy. What was I thinking? Did that article say anything about that expecting child number five might not be the best time? We stopped in at Alan Vett's puppy room just to look. Four boys and my belly round with baby girl due in March. It seemed like a safe idea. Morning sickness was a distant memory. I could do this. We had just finished reading Jean Fritz's Champion Dog Prince Tom, and there he sat, smaller than his noisy jumping sisters. He looked at me, and I can still see the love in his eyes. He had my heart. Of course, we named him Prince. Prince became one of the pack, but old school thinking and the lack of fleet treatment back then made us try to make him an outdoor dog, or at least one kept strictly in the kitchen when he did come in. He rarely barked, but had one character flaw. He fulfilled the role of chasing cats from the yard, yes, but from the yard and beyond. He skillfully climbed the fence despite the additional electric collar. For the rest of his life, we were full of stories of him running away and us searching or others returning. One cold winter day, the river frozen solid, I got a call. Ma'am, are you missing your dog? Not sure I had noticed yet among the clamor, but indeed, yes, we were missing our dog. I loaded my five kids into our vinyl upholstered van and reluctantly retrieved him from across the river. We penned a poem to relate the story for years to come. Prince, prancing on the ice. How come you don't smell so nice? Ringy dingy on the phone. Sewage treatment calls our home. We have your dog. I'm sure you're glad. But I hate to say he smells real bad. What made him jump, we do not know. But into our tank, he did go. I called the vet to ask, what exactly do I wash my dog with to sanitize him after jumping into the sewage treatment plant tank? Four baths later, I can report that no one got sick and Prince went on to give us 15 years of family memories. That's it. That's it. That's it. We appreciate it.